enormous responsibility is on the shoulders of anyone who is lucky enough to be successful. Perfection does not exist. There's a story behind every story. I saw hope and possibility in life and love and meaning inside of the difficulties. This is my story and this is my life and I can't hide it. The shock of the impact of what you actually seen and smelled and touched, it stays with you. Every single person can make a difference in the world and every little thing counts. I'm a guy who uh, want to write his own story. Today we meet two people who have both survived the horror of brutal wars. Michelle Chiquinini as a child forced to become a soldier. Romeo Dallaire as a soldier forced to break rank to save lives. The atrocities they witnessed would silence most, but instead they speak out for those who can't to end the plight of child soldiers. Two generations, two very different experiences. Overcoming monumental tragedy, they have become shameless idealists. I was born in Holland, and at six months, I came over with my mother on a Red Cross ship through Pier 21. We lived in Quebec City for a number of years and then moved to Montreal. My father was a professional soldier. I used to help him with his uniform and cleaning his boots and so on. We were playing with toy soldiers and playing in sand pits and building fortresses and doing great battles. The army has been in the family and uh, it fell into it. There was a comfort zone of being in that. I was born on uh, January 1st, 1988, in a town called Beni. It's in the province of South Kivu in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I had two older sisters, uh, a younger sister. My dad was very big on rules. Uh, my house was, had so many rules, uh, but the one rule that I never followed as a kid was the rule to always be home before 6 p.m. My dad just loved politics but hated the corruption that was going on at that time, so he chose to become a human rights activist as a result. My mom, on the other hand, was a women's rights activist. Uh, so I knew a lot of what was going on, especially in other countries uh, that the bordered Congo. One of the bordering countries was Rwanda, a brutal conflict between two warring tribal communities. The Hutus and the Tutsis had captured international attention in the early 90s. As the threat of civil war spread, the United Nations stepped up its peacekeeping efforts and called on Romeo Dallaire to lead its Rwanda mission. I landed and immediately the ministers made me feel that uh, they felt I could help them. But Rwanda was quickly escalating into a level of violence that would test General Dallaire in ways he could never have imagined. The situation was getting worse, and the rebels were, uh, were getting stronger in the north on the borders, and we knew that they had plans for doing mass murders. So it was absolutely crucial to get those weapons out of their hands and stop the training of the militia. And so I simply dictated the cable that essentially said to the UN, we must stop the distribution of weapons. We've got to get at the people who are creating these caches. And so in 36 hours, I will be launching my first operation. We went into high gear planning only seven hours later to get the fastest cable I ever got from the UN, saying it was outside of my mandate and I was not authorized to do it. Getting an answer from the UN saying I'm not allowed to do it put me in a, a quandary in regards to the future of the mission and pushed my loyalty to my uniform and to my mission to a limit that I had never ever imagined possible. There was a great sense of the situation going catastrophic. And I certainly got, not gonna sit there and just blindly obey the procedures and processes. And so I fought the UN. At about the same time as violent chaos reigned in Rwanda, Michelle Chiquinine was a five-year-old boy living a normal childhood in the Congo, 
passing time with his best friend, Kevin. I went to play soccer with Kevin and a lot of my friends in the soccer field. As I'm running around, I saw an army truck. And the army truck stopped. And out of the army trucks, these soldiers got out of them. I heard a gunshot going off in the background. And right away, we all fell on the ground. When I heard this huge voice telling us to stand up, and all the kids did, then they shoved us into the trucks forcefully, and they drove away. When we got to the camp, they divided us from the youngest to the oldest, and they put us into lines. I hanged on to my friend Kevin, and they pulled him away from me. Then they grabbed a, a cloth, and they put it over my eyes, and at this time, they kept laughing. They grabbed my hand, and they said that they're going to make us part of their army. The Rwandan Civil War tore through the country. Romeo Dallaire broke ranks with his superiors at the United Nations in a desperate attempt to save civilians from genocide. I broke uh, the orders because uh, they were immoral. If the logic was the world could handle 800,000 dead Rwandans but couldn't handle 450 dead Blue Berets, there was something fundamentally erroneous in the moral references of that. And that's what drove us to stay. Those who would suffer would be the civilian population, be they child soldiers who are used by the, the, the different factions, or the general population who are abused, turned into refugees, uh, internally displaced, often raped, no food, no water, dying of cholera. So it might have been a legal order, but it was absolutely immoral. We were running out of food. Uh, we ran out of fuel. We had one phone working, uh, no water, and completely isolated and surrounded. And so there was a sense of abandonment that ultimately we simply would be written off. However, we'll stay to at least save one witness to be able to tell the world afterwards what had happened. Many of the paramilitary that Dallaire and his UN forces had to face were mere children, forcibly conscripted to the cause. Across the border from Rwanda in Congo, this was the fate of five-year-old Michel Chiquanine and his best friend, Kevin. They grabbed this knife and they grabbed my left hand and they slashed it. And in so much pain, I screamed for them to let go of my hand as I'm bleeding. And they kept laughing. Then one of them came and they grabbed this thing called brown brown. It was, it's a mixture of cocaine and gunpowder. At that time, I didn't know what it was, and they said it was going to make me feel better. And they rubbed this into the wound. It was so painful. And I could feel my body just uh, pounding. I, I didn't understand what was going on. And I started to cry, and I'm screaming for help. I got so dazed, I didn't know what, I, what was going on, that they told me to put my hands up. And as I did, they dropped an AK-47 in my hand. At the time, I didn't know what it was. And they grabbed my hand and my finger, and they put it on the trigger. And they kept yelling at me to shoot, and it kept getting louder and louder. And at this time, with the influence of these drugs and so much going on, I, I pulled the trigger. And as I dropped the gun on the ground, they took off the blindfold. So I looked in front of me and saw a pool of blood just flowing in front of me. And Kevin was lying there. And he looked at me, he didn't say anything, but he just smiled and uh, a tear fell down his right cheek. And it was then that I realized when his face dropped in the ground that he had died. I relive that moment every day and try to find a way to not see that face falling on the ground and that tear. Haunted by his actions, Michelle now lived in complete fear and felt totally abandoned. We were told when our families would never like us again for having killed our friends. So this was going to be our only family. And I mean, for many times during the nights, we, this is what we thought. This is our life. This is what it was going to be like. But there was also this fear that tomorrow I'm going to be the next one put in front of the kids and shot and killed. 
looking at a child soldier who's got a rifle pointed on your nose, you're not looking at his eyes as much as, first of all, you're looking at the muzzle of that rifle. But then when you do see the eyes, they are under a lot of pressure from their peers, probably not uh, all their fatigue and maybe some drugs or, or alcohol and so on influencing them. You see panic, but there's an unpredictability there uh, that you uh, don't necessarily see in a professional soldier. And that unpredictability makes the child soldier that much more lethal. But no matter how hard his captors tried to control him, Michelle was determined to get home. We were eventually told we're going to be deployed to this village. And this village, it had food, he had gun supplies, and we needed all of this stuff to survive. So when the kids were running through, I just stayed in one spot and waited for the other kids to go through. And eventually, I, I saw a signal for the kids to attack. And then we started hearing people screaming and gunshots going off and hearing grenades and things like that, and people screaming for help. And that's when I started looking around and trying to make sure if there was a way for me to run the opposite way. And I ran across this clearing of trees. And I remember running there and getting so scared that I don't know where I'm going. I started to cry. And I screamed for my dad's name as I'm running. And at night, I would like sleep under the trees, being scared and cold. I just knew I had to be home. That was, that was only it. And eventually, I realized that uh, I was next to a village where my family was. And I was thankful that the person who was next to the store where I ended up knew my family and took me back. I told my mom and dad what I'd went on. And my dad told me never to say anything, that not to worry, he will take care of me. And I lived at my house for a very long time. I lived, never went outside. I only stayed in my house. I mean, after being a child soldier for so long, the, just the experience of being there and the things, having killed Kevin, having seen other kids being killed, I, I don't think any kid can process the whole experience in general, and I never did. Every night I'd wake up and I'd see blood on my hands. I'd wake up screaming because I'm thinking the soldiers are going to chase me there. There's so much fear, and every day it was a different challenge. And for the longest time, I always thought that kids, all kids around the world, went through something similar. By late 1994, Romeo Dallaire and Michelle Chiquinini had returned to their homes in Canada and Congo. Their struggles were not over. There's a rebel group that came through my town of Beni that called themselves the Movement for the Liberation of Congo. So they went and they killed the mayor. They killed his kids and his family. They killed most of the politicians in Beni, trying to destabilize the whole town. So my father started to write a lot of these articles to send them to the international media so that the United Nations, who had given the mandate to Rwanda to come into Congo, so they, they would stop this. And eventually, they hated my father along with the other activists in Beni, and they kidnapped him, and they tortured them. For about seven months, we didn't hear from them. And we had thought that my father had died, and we had given up hope. We had actually started preparing a funeral for him, along with six other activists. But one day, they got word that Michelle's father and his colleagues were being held close by. My dad survived, and I mean, a few months later, we had to help him escape to Uganda for exile. And then the rebel soldiers came to my house to look for him. And when I started hearing gunshots outside my house, and I heard my mom in the kitchen screaming for help, heard, heard Vicky and Vivian, my two older sisters, screaming for help. As I got to the stairs, and I looked back, and there's a rebel soldier with a gun pointed straight to my head. And he took me down to the kitchen where I saw a lot of the tapes and the articles my father had been writing about this war, all being burnt down in the living room. He took me to the kitchen and they sh I saw my mom and my two older sisters. Then one of the rebel soldiers approached me with a pistol and they put it in my right eye. And they told me that if I closed my eyes that they would shoot me. And they grabbed Vicky, Vivienne, and my mom and they threw them on the ground. My mom's screaming for me to help her, but I can't move. 
And at 10 years old, uh, they forced me to watch them being raped. I tried to stop them, and I tried to grab one of the soldiers to not go on my mom, and I tried, tried to punch him away. And they're looking at me, and they're laughing, and they knocked me over, uh, and they shot me onto a wall. With a machete, they tried to cut my throat so they could kill me. But they looked at me, and they grabbed my face, and they slashed my left cheek, where I still have a scar. And as I'm bleeding, they said, the reason why we're doing this is because your dad chose to stand up against us. The reason why we're doing this is because we want you to remember what happened here today. And they let me go. And eventually, they left after they were done. And I went to my mom to ask her what to do, but she was just curled up on the ground in tears. With her village no longer safe, Michelle, his mother, and youngest sister refused to stay. In December 1998, my family arrived in northern Uganda in a refugee camp. Uh, my dad had already been settled there and was waiting for us to arrive. It was a very difficult life living there, very, very difficult, because you never saw hope. Everybody was just trying to fend off and stay alive. While Michelle and his family had escaped to a new kind of hell, Romeo Dallaire also found himself back home struggling to keep his demons at bay. So we come back from those missions uh, significantly affected psychologically by the extremes that we've lived, by what you see, what you participate in, and what you can't do anything about. Uh, creates an inability to sleep, and often even pushes you to extremes like trying to stop the pain by taking away your life. And the theory of the time was, don't worry about it. With time and hard work, it'll all disappear. Well, on the contrary. The shock of the impact by what you actually seen and smelled and touched, it stays with you, and it wasn't going away. <laughs> In 2004, two extraordinary events took place. Romeo Dallaire testified at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda to help convict Colonel Teoneste Begasora for genocide and the killing of 10 Belgian peacekeepers. In fact, at one point yesterday, I, I had the sense of the smell of the slaughter in my nose. And though Michel Chiquinine and his family were mourning the loss of his father, they also received life-changing news. And in 2004, after the death of my dad, the UNHCR and Immigration Canada gave us a one-way ticket to come to Canada. And I'll never forget it, uh, January 21st, 2004. One of the happiest days of my life. Because um, I remember getting on the plane and thinking that never again will I have to look back in fear that I'm gonna get killed. I'm so lucky and blessed to be where I am today that that keeps me smiling, that I'm able to go to school. I mean, I'm, I'm in university, I'm a university student. I never even thought that was ever possible. I mean, it's so incredible that I have this opportunity. I, I can't help but smile. In the years since the Civil War, Dallaire has worked tirelessly to share his story and fight injustice. We both want to eradicate the use of child soldiers. And so we're coming at it from, from the two sources. We should be involved in not only stopping these conflicts that are still going on, but actually get really involved in trying to prevent them from them going catastrophic and the recruitment to start in the first place. Dallaire has taken action speaking out as a soldier of peace at the youth empowerment event we did. I want to tell you a story. I was at a barrier during that genocide where they slaughtered over 350,000 young people under the age of 15. The barrier was manned by child soldiers, boys and girls. 40% of child soldiers are girls. They had been abducted and drugged up and indoctrinated. And they were armed because there's too many weapons in the world. And they are in the hands of these children. And so I stopped my vehicle and I opened the door. And it's about 13-year-old boy with his eyes huge. 
rammed an AK-47 machine gun right in my face. And as I saw him trying to decide whether he's going to pull the trigger and blow my head off or not, he spotted the chocolate bar in my hand. And he stopped. Are you more human than them? Then how come we're letting 250,000 of your peers, your ages, being ripped out of the schools, out of their homes, drugged up, armed, and used to kill, maim, and keep wars going? Why is that? One of the reasons is we don't hear your voices enough. You're their peers. It's up to you. Get involved, get your boots dirty, and get out there. Michel finally came to terms with his own past through work he's done with Free the Children. For a very, very long time, I never wanted to tell this story. I wanted to just bury it and forget about it. I've come to accept as I grew older that this is my story and this is my life and I can't hide it. It is part of who I am. It's incredible to see how deeply kids empathize with Michelle's experience as he interacts with them and tells his story. So it is with my education, with my memories and with my story that I realize that I can be more than just one student, that I can be somebody to create change in my own community and also around the world. I look up in the crowd and you see the impact of the story and you see people putting your face on the numbers that they hear every single day. And I think that's what's one of the most important aspects is putting your face to the numbers. Thank you. But if actions are not taken, then my story has no meaning. I bring the story of somebody who lived it. You bring an experience of somebody who saw it and had a dilemma, what do you do when you're faced with this experience? Mm. I think it's a, it's a very insightful idea. <laughs> Take care. Thank you too. Stay healthy. Stay healthy.